Sometimes, for reasons we shall explore, Earth and the species on it come to blows. Are we next to be knocked out? History teaches us only what to expect. We have at least those five catastrophic planetary events to learn from if we are to avoid a human calamity. The Earth has suffered uh, five great mass extinction events, and this has been since the last half a billion years. Uh, these have been dubbed the, the Great Five, or the Big Five. The first recognized one is the end Ordovician ex mass extinction, which brought to an abrupt halt, sort of a big diversification event where lots of new groups evolved. It's not known whether there were really any plants at all on land before that. And uh, it's now thought that uh, the main reason this happened was a massive ice age, a very brief, probably less than a million years in length. Um, for comparison, our current ice age that we're in has lasted for at least two and a half, possibly five million years. So this was very brief and very sharp. So sea levels fell very quickly, lots of environments were lost, and then it ended abruptly again, sea levels rose again, so it caused more disruption. Certainly after that, we've got evidence, um, hard evidence of pollen from the land and even some insects and things showing that um, life had moved out onto the land during the late Ordovician and into the Silurian. But after that, soon after that, they actually started to evolve into large trees during the Devonian, late Silurian and into the Devonian. And so there are what we see today known as lycopods or club mosses, little moss-like things that live near water still. Um, and today they're quite small, but they were able to grow into these large trees, the first large trees and first forests. And these forests actually altered, we have evidence they altered the carbon cycle. Because these large trees were able to grow across the empty landscapes, um, they their roots dug down into the soils and they, and they caused um, extreme erosion. And so the soils were actually then washed away into the um, oceans and this changed the whole carbon cycle. The next one was the uh, late Devonian mass extinction. Um, in that case, it appears that lots of the ocean just suffocated, basically. There were things going on that caused the ocean to lose a lot of its oxygen. Possibly um, newly evolved uh, land plants caused a lot more um, erosion by digging in their roots and causing nutrients to run off, causing algal blooms, which sucked oxygen out as they decayed. And it, a lot of evidence does point towards um, the change, these significant changes on the land and to the carbon cycle as um, being one of the primary drivers of the mass extinction. And so the ocean floors became sort of dead zones and, and there were several pulses. It wasn't just one individual event. So this spread out over millions of years, um, quite different to the previous one, as I mentioned. It's hard for people to really imagine this, but there are more types of animals in the past than there are today. So even during, right before, um, like before the dinosaurs at this point in time, um, we're talking about the Permian, right before the biggest ex extinction event ever, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, there were huge diversities of different types of animals and really complex so-called ecological tiering as well arguably as complex as today. And people don't realize that there are just so many more different types of animals. And with each subsequent extinction, we keep losing body plans. So as today, we, if we're on the verge of uh, another great extinction, um, we, we can actually show in the past that this has happened where we lose all these body plans. And there are some organisms uh, which are really rare today and they're on the brink of extinction. And we can actually see we're gonna lose major body plans again unless they're conserved. But we can actually look and learn a lot from the fossil record to show what actually can happen after a mass extinction and how the world changes or can change. 
the largest mass extinction event ever to occur, almost entirely wiped life from Earth. The greatest extinction event to ever strike the Earth uh, occurred about 252 million years ago. Uh, this is called the Great Dying, uh, but it's at the Permian-Triassic mass extinction boundary. Um, so at this point in time, as far as we know from all of the, the fossil studies that have been done in terms of all the geologic sections around the planet, um, on land and in the sea, uh, we know that, um, that the extinction magnitude was uh, on a scale that we just really can't imagine at about 95% of all life on the planet becoming extinct. It was the only mass extinction that affected insects as far as we know. The other ones seem to not affect insects as much. And it, um, it's thought to probably be caused by a whole combination of, uh, of events that caused a perfect storm of, of bad environments. Um, so you had things like a, a major greenhouse event spike, a uh, place warmed by up to 10 degrees very quickly, probably possibly multiple times. There's even the thought that um, a new type of bacterium evolved that was able to decompose um, carbon on the seafloor and turn it into methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. So this affected the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and there's also a lot of um, acids and toxins released into the atmosphere. So this would have really affected the life on the land and particularly the plants themselves. So these huge forests were actually wiped out at this time. And probably a lot of hydrogen sulfide came out of the oceans because they were stagnating and hydrogen sulfide is quite a toxic gas um, and it, it caused a lot of things to maybe die out from that um, and that took a long time to recover from it was sort of a what's known as a coal gap meaning there were no forests for about five year, five million years um, and a coral gap which means there's, there were no reefs um, in the in the oceans for a long time um, and the, uh, the oxygen levels in the atmosphere plummeted from something close to about 30% in the atmosphere um, compared to today's 21, um, possibly dropping down to 10%. So that's like being on Mount Everest basically at seafloor in terms of the, the oxygen density. As for the big dying, that's, that's more complicated because it was such a bad <laughs> environment for such a long time that was caused by this, these various factors. And we can see in the fossil record that there's, um, the climate seemed to just fluctuate wildly for a good five million years after the mass extinction. So species that survived that initial dying still had to weather all these big changes that came afterwards. And it seems like a lot of the ones that survived were generalists. So we say today, oh, if there's another catastrophe, it'll be the rats and the seagulls and the cockroaches that will survive. And they're, they are quite good generalists. They can survive on just about anything. Um, they're not specialized to any particular food or, um, and they have rapid breeding cycles as well, which helps. So things like, say, an elephant that has a long breeding cycle, they might not survive so well, and only few offspring. And that seems to be the pattern back then as well. But there are other groups that seem to have weathered previous environmental changes that were knocked out. Some organisms, such as the seafloor scavenging trilobites, survived numerous extinction events. One of the most successful organisms in the sea uh, were the trilobites, uh, which were uh, a type of arthropod. They were successful for several hundred million years. They evolved uh, in the latest Precambrian, um, as far as we know, so we're talking about 550 or so million years ago, but they were extremely successful uh, in the sea for various reasons. Um, they also uh, replaced several organisms that were uh, really uh, diverse, such as the, the so-called cup animals or archaeocyathids, okay, which uh, disturbed their habitats. And basically there was an arms race at this time. So probably trilobites are in the top three groups that people know about when, the, when you talk about extinct things just after the dinosaurs and the ammonites. Um, they certainly were one of the very first groups that were 
quite dominant in the oceans, thousands of species right early on. Some of the very best eyesight with their compound eyes and a lens made out of a crystal of calcite, quite amazing, the only animal to ever do that. But um, they, uh, they had weathered many uh, different events, including, I assume, uh, various different uh, apex predators coming in from initially uh, large nautiloids um, and then to the sea scorpions and then the armor-plated fish and they seem to weather all of those with all these defenses, very spiny. Um, but at the end, Devonian extinction events, um, they were heavily uh, impacted and almost none of them made it through except for one small group that sort of still struggled on until finally getting wiped out in the Permian. So they were almost all um, bottom dwelling on the ocean floor, um, really reliant on the on the sea floor. So you have the legs, you can sometimes see their tracks where they shuffled up the sediment and they, they ate the, uh, the animals and, the, and other creatures that lived in the sediment. So if the sea floors were really starting to die and nothing sort of lived there, um, their whole food chain collapsed. So that I'm assuming is is a major reason why they just couldn't quite make it through. They were heavily reliant on the on the sea floors being full of oxygen and full of life. Um, it's quite sad because they're very cool animals. I mean, um, such a diversity and, and beautiful shapes. One adaptable organism survived the great dying. Lystrosaurus went on to become the ancestor of dinosaurs and mammals alike, including humans. So during the Permian uh, in Pangaea, uh, we know from the fossil record that there were high diversities of tetrapods, so four-legged organisms like this guy here, uh, which is called Lystrosaurus. For some reason, it had attributes that enabled it to cross this boundary uh, relatively unscathed. So we know by looking at the skeleton, it probably did scavenge. It had a uh, barrel chest in terms of uh, air capacity as well. We know that the air was probably fairly thin. It was basically life under uh, a green sky, very different from today because of the hydrogen uh, sulfide gas. Very few other organisms persisted across this boundary. And of course, these were very important tetrapods because they evolved eventually into uh, mammals, okay, including us. Um, in terms of recovery, we estimate that it took about 100 million years for the ecosystems to recover after that mass extinction. And then not too long after, I guess, a few tens of millions of years later, the end Triassic extinction occurred. It's possibly one of the most mysterious ones because uh, I think there's fewer causes that have been identified for it, but it might again be uh, big volcanic eruptions that caused big climate changes um, to, to occur massively. Volcanism can have amazing impacts on climate and the environment in several different ways. So first of all, if you have a big volcanic eruption, um, there's lots of dirt and dust and chemicals that get added to the atmosphere. Um, one part of those are sulfide oxides or maybe even hydrogen sulfides. And these can, first of all, form sulfide aerosols. These are really tiny particles that actually get into the really high atmosphere and they can stay there for a long time. And by doing so, they will shield the atmosphere. It's like a blanket. So incoming solar radiation actually doesn't get quite through and it becomes cold for a few days, months, maybe even years if it's a big eruption and it becomes darker. If it's a really big eruption, um, it might even become so dark that photosynthesis becomes a problem. Well, um, a lot of people think that the Triassic was pretty much a stressed environment throughout, um, largely due to the oxygen levels in the atmosphere remaining really low. So um, the oxygen levels in the Carboniferous to Permian, um, it's the big ice age there, had gone up to 30, 32%, which is massive like compared to 21 percent today and uh, largely due to the big growth in terrestrial forests that had evolved and it allowed all sorts of things to evolve giant insects um, towards the late permian even before the mass extinction um, oxygen levels really started dropping and 
indications are that in the early Triassic uh, oxygen levels stayed close to 10 or 12 percent which is half of what we have today it's really quite extremely low and it seems that they didn't really get up to closer to modern levels again until into the Jurassic after the mass extinction um, at the end of the Triassic. But the interesting thing about it is that it probably encouraged some groups to evolve really efficient breathing. So if you think about the, the birds today, they have circular breathing. They don't really have to breathe in and out as much as they just have a they have lots of air pockets to really get the oxygen out and that might be a legacy of the early dinosaur ancestors evolving in the Triassic to deal with these low oxygen levels. So that stressed environment had some unintended consequences later, which is why we see such success in the birds today, able to fly, which is high oxygen demand. After that, we have the big golden age of the dinosaurs that lasted for a long time until it was brought to the end by the most famous, uh, popularly famous extinction, the, the dinosaur extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. In fact, we now can date it to about 66.03 million years ago. Famously, there was a big asteroid impact, probably the biggest asteroid impact in the last half a billion years. So we're talking upwards of maybe even a trillion tons of rock just hurling through space, uh, heading towards uh, our Earth. And at, when it did actually reach our Earth, okay, it would have uh, gone through the atmosphere within a fraction of a second, and it hit the Earth created a hole that was probably about 30 kilometers deep, and we know about 180 to 200 kilometers wide. So that alone is pretty bad. Um, but there was also indication that there was a lot of greenhouse gases being emitted by these big um, volcanic eruptions, continent-wise eruptions in India um, that caused greenhouse spikes. And um, we can see that in, in animal populations that were pretty stressed already before the asteroid hit. Any organism even close to it would have been uh, basically incinerated from the fireball. Okay. Um, so this again had this effect where um, it affected the base of the food chain because there was a dust cloud that enveloped the earth. So it affected plants at the base of the food chain and again we had this propagating effect all the way up through to the apex predators. So the asteroid might have just been the last um, bad news for, uh, for all of life. and. Um, it, uh, yeah, it caused the non-avian dinosaurs to die out, but many other groups went as well at the same time. So in our extinction story, um, it's really important to uh, differentiate between background extinction and mass extinction. So when we actually look at background extinction rates, we can compare the modern to the fossil record. So we can actually delve into the geologic past by looking at organisms. And what we see, uh, which is really important, is that, for example, if you look at mammal fossils, uh, probably one mammal uh, species per 1,000 years became extinct. So that's background extinction. If you look at the present day, we estimate that in relative to background extinction rates, the extinction rate today is something on the order of about 1,000 times okay, what it is if we look at the fossil record. Coming from a background of geology and looking into deep time, we've, it's been quite well established that there is a clear solid link between carbon levels, especially carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and climate. Now it's not always the carbon dioxide that causes the climate change to start with, but it's either the first thing that the change in carbon dioxide up or down is very closely associated with massive climate change. So sometimes the carbon dioxide changes ahead of time. So things like massive volcanism can cause uh, warming. Um, in some cases, like the Ordovician extinction, big mountain building 
that weathering actually draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and that causes the carbon dioxide to plunge, which is what probably happened there causing an ice age. Um, at other times it can be other causes like uh, the Earth's orbit that, um, can change its shape. It regularly does that in a predictable way. Um, and then those changes in the from the sun's radiation um, causes a start in shift towards warmer or colder, but then that um, initiates sort of a feedback with the carbon dioxide. So the warmer it gets, often the carbon dioxide goes along starts going up as well, which causes more warming, which causes more carbon dioxide. So um, carbon dioxide either um, initiates the, the warming or cooling or it exacerbates the, the change. And the quicker it changes, the more rapidly the climate changes. And rapid climate change often leads to species not being able to adapt quick enough. And um, if the environments shift too fast for specialized species, they die out and, and if that goes above the what we call background extinction rates um, we start seeing um, in, um, sort of the clear markers of mass extinctions and there is the thought that at the moment the change is exceeding the rate at which species can sort of adapt um, and it's not like with all the other mass extinctions it's probably more a, a perfect storm of conditions um, not just one, like climate change or an asteroid, but a host of things that we have, not just climate change induced by humans at the moment, but we have um, uh, deforestation or, or urban sprawls or uh, habitat fragmentation, things like that, um, that are stopping species from adapting at a fast enough rate. So it's worrying to see where we're heading, knowing what's happened in the past. It's really important that we actually understand these species and the effect that we're having with all this deforestation and other things that are happening around the planet, uh, which is also affecting climate. Because uh, another factor um, which affects species as well is, in fact, some uh, groups of organisms are very controlled by temperature. And even the slightest increase in temperature can affect their uh, distribution and actually make their populations dwindle through time. Uh, so there are various um, Im important factors, um, and these factors that control uh, species through time relate to um, ecosystem energy supply, they relate to climatic events as well, uh, so various aspects of climate which are quite diverse uh, when we talk about them. Uh, it could actually um, mean about where they live, to live on a seafloor in terms of bathymetry, their depth constraints as well, with sea level rise and fall, um, that really affects them as well. So there's a huge number of parameters that affect a species through time and space, uh, which are important to consider. And with so many species becoming extinct, uh, we know that there's a massive problem in the environment. Yeah, the ecosystems, um, uh, particularly the rainforests in South America and the Amazon um, or across Indonesia have been severely affected, um, not just by the changes in carbon dioxide, but initially by clearing. Um, and we also have um, our own very special um, rainforests that are extremely diverse up in the north of Queensland and also an extremely diverse um, flora called the Finbos in both Africa and southwestern Western Australia. So these are extremely diverse biomes and um, they're already uh, showing significant extinctions um, as a result of uh, both clearing and um, changes in the carbon dioxide levels that we've seen, which have been significantly greater in the last 50 years. One of the groups that always gets raised as, well, how did they survive but the others didn't, is things like crocodiles and alligators. They've been around for longer than the dinosaurs and they're still around. And the recent massive freeze in Florida was an interesting, brought up some interesting images of crocodiles uh, or alligators there basically poking their snouts through the ice and getting frozen in and going into a hibernation state. And so if you think about the, in this case, the um, mass extinction at the end of the dinosaur age, the Cretaceous, where there was probably almost a nuclear winter from the um, impact, um, that 
was probably a perfect way for them to survive that, where there was no food around for many years. Um, so, so they they had some ability to to just weather it, whereas maybe some more active species, like the sort of warm-blooded um, early birds, um, a lot of the dinosaurs that needed a lot of food, the big ones, um, they just couldn't weather it out for all those years. If we pay attention to it, one other event provides a lesson in carbon dioxide absorption in the oceans, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. The Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which is a mouthful, we usually call it PETM, um, was a very abrupt, short warming event um, that happened about 55 million years ago. Uh, atmospheric temperatures rose by five to eight degrees. And what is interesting is that it's actually one of the biggest mass extinctions in the deep ocean. And that's unusual because usually living conditions in the deep ocean are quite constant and we much more rarely see big mass extinctions there. So what we know is that this event was caused by a massive release of carbon into the atmosphere. There's still some controversy about where this carbon came from. It might have been enhanced volcanism, it might have been methane hydrates. Um, but certainly this release happened fast on a geological time scale. And we now pretty much think that this release happened at a much slower rate than what we see today, about at least 10 times, if not 100 times slower. And that has interesting implications, because if you add CO2 into the atmosphere, the CO2 will be absorbed by the oceans. And when the ocean absorbs this carbon dioxide, actually carbonate ions get depleted in the ocean. And that's bad news for any organism that lives in the ocean that builds shells out of calcite or argonite, because they need these carbonate ions to actually build their shells. Calcification rates, the way that the animals build up their shells with calcium carbonate has dropped. Um, there are things that are becoming thinner in their shells, which, which makes them more susceptible to other stresses. Um, and, and that's um, just an additional problem for them. So climate change by itself isn't the whole story. The acidification is a big issue and it has been in past extinctions as well. You can see the effect of the ocean acidification in those mass extinctions in the past where shells get more um, less stable and things like that. Um, and, and the expansion of ocean dead zones is a big story at the moment as well where they've uh, increased fourfold from what we knew maybe 50 years ago. So, so those dead zones, as, as I've said, from other extinction events are a big part of the stressors in, in these mass extinction events, and they're undoubtedly occurring. So the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum was this unbelievable period in Earth history when the Earth really warmed up around the whole globe at temperatures that we haven't seen for a very long time. So there were crocodiles living in the Arctic. There were forests, and they're still preserved. You can burn the wood from those forests from 80 degrees north latitude. Like the whole planet was a different place. And it shows us that climate change is part of Earth history. It's a natural part of Earth history. The difference, though, is that even that enormous temperature change, that whole change in the Earth climate system, occurred naturally over a relatively long period of time, millions of years. The difference with today is that that change is on the order of tens of years. It's happening so fast that the natural systems are out of balance. And that's a real challenge, not just for us, but actually for most living things on the planet. I think it's uncontroversial that human activity of one form or another, um, even without the climate change, is causing things to go extinct. And that's been documented for many things over the last couple of hundred years. Um, big mammal groups that used to be massively abundant are gone. So um, how much is really going extinct is very hard to tell because it would take 
half the population of the world to do sort of ecological surveys almost every year just to keep an eye on how things are doing. Um, there's obviously not those resources. So as a paleontologist, it's easier because it's all the experiments been done. You can look at the fossil record as imperfect as it is. Things that are happening right now are hard to really definitively say. But I would say that in the oceans especially, things things like um, ocean acidification, where the, the raising of the carbon dioxide levels in the ocean waters, where most of the carbon dioxide is going at the moment, um, that little bit of acidification, which is not that little, it's gone by two decimal points, which is about a rise of um, well over 30% in acidity, really, because it's a logarithmic scale. I think the um, fossil record tells us about events that have occurred in the past where um, carbon dioxide has run away um, in terms of uh, quantity in the atmosphere. Um, we've also seen often coinciding with that those uh, toxic gases and release of methane and all of these events have had dire consequences for ecosystems on the land and also in the ocean. In terms of sea level rise, all of the ice volume, okay, a lot of ice is being melted currently with the glaciers in, in the north and also in the southern hemispheres. So big changes are happening in the environment, but they're happening very quickly, and that's one of the big issues that humans are facing today. Well, if left unchecked, we know for sure that temperatures will continue to rise, CO2 will continue to rise, um, acidification will continue and become much more severe. Um, I think we already see the impacts right now. Um, lots of ecosystems really struggle to keep up with these changes. Um, and and when, when temperatures change, then animals or plants might be able to migrate to higher latitudes, but maybe not fast enough. Maybe there will be whole new ecosystem structures that will need to be established. Ocean acidification is if oceans become too acidic to sustain certain life, um, other winners, other disaster taxa, as we call them, will certainly survive, but it will be a very different world. <laughs>